If you have your Bible with you, uh, you can open up to the book of James chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to put one on, in your hand and go ahead and just raise your hand and we have some gentlemen who will bring one for you and, and you can have that. We're going to be looking at James this morning, James chapter 2. The book of James contains some of the most practical instruction for the Christian life. Some of the most practical instruction for the Christian life is found in the book of James. And what we see in the book of James is really what should be characteristics of the Christian. In James' instruction, so much should be attributes of the Christian that a failure to walk in obedience, a failure to walk in what James sets forth, should be cause for the Christian to take spiritual inventory. Many have suggested that the book of James is really about tests, tests of assurance of salvation, and every Christian benefits from evaluating his or her own life, right? We all benefit from evaluating our lives in light of God's word to determine whether or not we are really in the faith. Paul sets that forth in 2 Corinthians, the test of assurance, is Christ in you? Do you have assurance of salvation? Are you confident in God's work in you? What would need to be present in you today in order for you to experience assurance of salvation? Or, another question, what are you currently basing your confidence in? If you think you're a Christian, why? What is the practical fruit in your life that's caused you to determine, yes, indeed, I am in the faith? When you think of someone who's mature in their faith, what things come to mind? Someone walking in obedience to God, someone living faithfully before God for the glory of God. When you think of someone who you esteem as holy and followable in their faith, what character traits come to mind? When you think of wanting to grow in your faith, when you think of what key indicators that God is at work in growing you, what do you think of? What's on that list? In fact, when you think of what holiness would most look like in your life, what's on that list? What makes the list of distinguishing characteristics of the Christian life? Maybe you would think, how I respond to trials. That should be on the list. Trials are inevitable. Everyone has gone through a trial. You're either in a trial or you're about to be in a trial. It's the reality. And Christians possess the ability to have perspective and hope and endurance in trials that non-believers simply don't have. We have the ability to experience trials and to consider them joy. That's unique to the Christian walk. James addresses this in chapter 1. Maybe you think of how one responds to temptation. The Christian has a new master, is no longer living for themselves and enslaved to sin, but is living for God and now by God's grace can resist temptation. And we can wage war with our flesh. What we could not be before, we can be now in Christ. And what we could not do before, we can do in Christ. We can be pleasing to God in the resisting of sin. And James addresses that in chapter 1 as well. What else? Well, how one receives God's word would have to be a distinguishing characteristic of the mature, growing Christian, right? The one who is humbly receiving God's word. The one who is teachable, submissive, peaceful as they receive God's word is evidencing the Spirit's work in their life. This one receives God's word in a manner that leads to action. This one is not only a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. And James addresses that in chapter 1 as well. James also addresses how the Christian should view and take care of those in need, looking after or caring for and providing oversight of and the provisions for the widows and orphans. The idea of having eyes for the needy, eyes outside of ourselves, 
purity and holiness of life. All of these are marks of the Christian who is walking and living out their faith. But then James addresses something that may not be on our radar as it should. Something that at first glance may seem peripheral, secondary, a good thing but not crucial. James brings up favoritism, partiality. That is what we're going to look at today and next week as well. This morning is part one of a two-part message titled, Forsaking Favoritism. For, forsaking Favoritism. Let me ask you this. When was the last time you thought to yourself, I really want to honor God today, and I know that I am completely capable of and prone to favoritism. So God, help me. Protect me from that. When was the last time you paused and specifically thought about how you might not be partial in your treatment towards others? When was the last time you were preparing on a Sunday morning to join the corporate gathering of believers and you thought to yourself, Lord, please guard me from being partial towards people who join our assembly? What about small group? What about other get-togethers? Avoiding favoritism, fleeing from partiality among ourselves is critically important to God. And it must never be a staple of the church. Having favoritism, having partiality can never be a, a staple, a character trait of Grace Bible Church. We must flee it. Is it present in your life? As you ponder your own life, do you show favoritism? Are you partial? Avoiding partiality and personal favoritism should be intentionally on our hearts and minds as it is on God's. And today and next week, we're going to look at what James has to say regarding this topic. We're going to read together James 2, 1 through 13. This morning, we're specifically going to look at verses 1 through 4. So look at James 2, verses 1 through 13. James says, my brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in the faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But... If you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So, speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty, for judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's pray. God, your word is rich. Thank you for this text that we get to look closer at this morning. And I pray as we do so that we would be eager to want to conform our lives under your word, to your word. 
Help us to see what we must about our own hearts. And Lord, I pray, especially as we look at this command to forsake personal favoritism, I pray that we would see the God, the Lord, behind the command, that we would be awed, that we would be captivated by you and your character that's put on display gloriously in this very command. So God, give us ears to hear what we must. Help us to see you in all your splendor in this text. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. This week, we're going to look at God's disapproval of favoritism. God's disapproval, disapproval of favoritism. And next week, we're going to answer the question, why must I flee favoritism? Avoiding favoritism or partiality is imperative to the Christian life. Being impartial must be a character trait of us all. In fact, this characteristic originates from what God is like. He is the standard and the perfect example, and we are called to imitate him in this. And this attribute is impartiality. Every Christian should be impartial in how he or she holds their faith. And it is important to understand that this is not something we're naturally prone to. We're not naturally prone to impartiality. We naturally discriminate. We are naturally inclined to be partial. We tend to put people in pigeonholes, in predetermined categories. We rank people in our hearts, and we do so based on their looks, off of their clothes, their race, their ethnicity, their social status, their personality, their intelligence, their wealth, their power, their houses, their cars, their possessions, their season of life. That is what we're inclined to do, but that is not how God views people. Deuteronomy 10, 17, Moses says, For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. And God's expectation is that his people reflect that same impartiality. Again, are you partial? Do you show favoritism? How do you treat the poor? How do you treat the needy? How do you treat, treat the rich or the influential? God clearly disapproves of favoritism, and God's disapproval of favoritism is expressed three ways in this passage. God's disapproval of favoritism is expressed in three ways in this passage. James sets forth three ways that demonstrate the unquestioned reality that God opposes favoritism. God is adamantly opposed to the practice of favoritism, and James sets forth three realities that express this. First, God's disapproval of favoritism is expressed, number one, in the command forbidding favoritism. God's disapproval of favoritism is expressed by the command forbidding favoritism. Look, look again at verse one. My brethren, it's right there. Do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. James begins this chapter with the endearing intro, my brethren. This indicates he's speaking out of love and as a fellow believer in Christ, this is an endearing preface to a strong encouragement, to a strong admonition, a strong command. It is imperative and yet tender. It is direct, yet kind. It is forceful, yet there's a gentle tone to what James is saying here. If you have genuine faith in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot hold that faith with partiality or favoritism. This is an emphatic command. It's crucial. It's of great importance. Favoritism is to have no place in the body of Christ. The life of a faithful Christian is to be void of favoritism. As followers of Jesus, who is so glorious, we must not make such improper distinctions among men. Every Christian is to hold their faith, to keep their faith free from favoritism. Favoritism. 
and we must understand it, it, it's not only unkind to show partiality, it's not only unkind to hold our faith with an attitude of favoritism, it's not only discourteous or disrespectful to have favoritism, but it is a serious sin. We'll unpack that more later. What is favoritism? What is being partial? Well, being partial in this way, it, it, it's totally in conflict with our salvation and with what Scripture teaches. If we're saved, if we are children of God, children of God do not show partiality towards others this way. We cannot have an attitude of personal favoritism. This means that we're not to judge others. What is, what is partiality? What is personal favoritism? It's judging others based on their appearance and on that basis giving special attention or special favor or special respect or consideration to certain individuals and not to others. This is where we judge purely on superficial things. We make distinctions. In our hearts, we have an attitude within us of valuing external, superficial things. And this attitude flows inevitably into how we treat those individuals. An attitude of personal favoritism, this, this set of words in the original is one word. And it has the literal meaning of lifting up someone's face with the idea of judging by appearance. And on that basis, giving special favor or respect to that individual. It's to judge simply on superficial things. This is where we treat some individuals because of how they look or how they act or how they sound or any other reason. And James says, listen, we who believe in a Savior so majestic, so awesome, so powerful, so mighty, so righteous, so holy, so infinitely glorious must see the complete vanity of all earthly glory and we must rise above being impressed by this worldly glory. We must rise above being impressed by it as worldly men are foolishly impressed by these vain superficial things. We must see souls. We must see people who are dead in their trespasses and sins and need the gospel. If it is a believer, we must see past the external and see a fellow heir of Christ. When you walk into a room full of people, what first comes to mind regarding those people? Do you recognize that every person has a soul and for every soul eternity hangs in the balance and how you treat them will bear a significant impact in their life how you hold your faith bears way into eternity the integrity of your proclamation of the gospel is on the line in whether or not you are impartial or not it's a clear command do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Obedience to this command starts at the heart level. It starts at the heart level, and it must flow to our extremities. It, it must start with our attitude and flow out of our actions. This command must be near and dear on our minds. This is a defining characteristic of us as believers that we would be impartial, that we wouldn't show favoritism. Well, what might this look like practically? James gives us an example. Look at number two. First, God's disapproval of favoritism is expressed by the command forbidding favoritism. And number two, next we see God's disapproval of favoritism is expressed by the case demonstrating favoritism. Number two, the case demonstrating favoritism. 
James tells us exactly what this might look like practically. Look at verse 2 again. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes a poor man in dirty clothes... Verse 3, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit by my footstool. That's the case. That's the example. That's the illustration that James sets forth. How might this play itself out practically? It's right there. It's important to understand that the majority of early convicts to Christianity were Jewish and they were poor. Either they were already poor or suddenly became poor when they turned to Christ. The implications of turning to Christ cost many everything financially. The cost was high to follow Jesus. Many were thrown out of their homes or lost their work because of turning to Jesus and lost their place in society because of turning to Christ. And their society was much like ours where preference and favoritism were shown towards those who had a specific status or looked to them. And not all were poor, but many were. So James' illustration shows the contrast. James' illustration is, is not the only circumstance in which partiality or favoritism might show itself or manifest itself, but it's a clear-cut example for us. In James' example, the two contrasted visitors are outsiders, One is rich, one is esteemed and ostentatious. The eye catches the expensive ring on his finger and is captivated by his fancy clothing. This one comes into the assembly of believers seemingly to see what their worship is like and there is also a poor man in dirty or shabby clothes. The eye at once notices this man's poverty. This man likewise seems to have heard of the Christians and wants to also see what their worship is like. Two very different people outwardly walk into the assembly and the Christians, most likely Jewish Christians, show special attention to the one wearing fine clothes. They give to this one a seat of honor, kind treatment, esteemed treatment, and then to the poor man, he is told to go stand over there. To be wedged in at the rear or to sit on the floor close to a person's footstool. Clearly, dishonor is shown to this man. No one would think of treating a rich person in the way that they just treated the poor man. And no one was thinking, apparently, of treating the poor man as they would the rich. It is clear that a distinction has been made, and with all of the wrong reasons and motives and Sin has taken place. Now, what is James not saying? James is not saying don't have friends among the assembly. He's not saying don't have people you're close to. He's not saying don't go talk to people that you know and love because you might give the wrong appearance. He's also not saying ignore people who have the outward appearance of being rich. It's not that we're to neglect the rich and esteem the poor. The correction of showing favoritism to the rich is not showing favoritism to the poor. In this illustration, the the clear sin, the lesson is partiality. It's making distinctions among yourselves. As verse 4 states. What might this look like for us? What might this look like for you on a Sunday morning? Walking in the door, passing visitors, sitting in your seat, before the service, during the break. How do you decide who to talk to on a Sunday morning? What grid do you have or use? Every week we have a brief time when the children are dismissed and it's a very unique opportunity to speak with each other. What grid do you have or use as to how you use that time? Do you look for people in the same season of life, the same age, same style, same age of children, people who appear, they want to have someone speak with them, 
Maybe you go after the people who appear that they don't want to have someone speak with them. Do you make such distinctions? Or if there is someone whom you don't recognize and they're breathing, you go and you welcome them and you don't make distinctions in your heart. You're hospitable, you're kind, you're loving towards every individual you see. What grid would God want you to have before service, after service, at small group? What is your heart disposition towards those who come into our assembly? God's disapproval of favoritism is expressed by the command forbidding favoritism. Number two, God's disapproval of favoritism is expressed by the case demonstrating favoritism. And lastly, God's disapproval of favoritism is expressed by the conclusion condemning favoritism. The conclusion condemning favoritism. What is the conclusion? Verse four, have you not made distinctions among yourselves? And become judges with evil motives. The conclusion of the hypothetical illustration is that by showing special favor to the well-dressed man and showing discourtesy or unkindness to the poor, poor man, sin has been committed. Those who act in such a way are guilty of favoritism and have become judges with evil motives. Among the body of Christ, this kind of behavior and discrimination is much more than just poor hospitality. It is evil. It's evil that we would judge on outward appearance those who enter in among us and treat some one way and others another. That is evil. Of the three words James uses for evil, the one used here is the strongest. And it carries the idea of vicious intentions that have a destructive effect. Vicious intentions that have a destructive effect. When we show partiality, We are revealing vicious intentions that have a destructive effect. Sobering. When we show favoritism, it brings a destructive effect upon the body of Christ. It's displeasing to the Lord. And the faith of those to whom James was writing should have taught them to show the same courtesy to all of their visitors and to not make distinctions, to not judge according to considerations that are, as James says, evil and actively wicked. And so it should be with us. Is the soul of one worth more than the soul of another? Think about that. Is the soul of one worth more than the soul of another? Are the rich more valuable to God? Is a specific race or culture, is a specific age or position, fame, more precious to God than another? That some would be more deserving of the gospel? No, of course not. Of course not. We must so broadly with no distinctions as if external worldly qualifiers should influence how we extend love towards others. No, we, we should be so bursting with the love of Christ that anyone, everyone who walks into our assembly, we immediately go to them and extend to them the love that we've received from our Savior and we show that same kind of love and compassion and unmerited kindness and we don't make distinctions in our hearts. We don't have favorites in the household of God. 
We should be so bursting with the love of Christ, which was freely lavished upon us when we did not deserve it, that we shower anyone and everyone who walks in that door with unparalleled love and hospitality. That kind of love and hospitality should characterize us, not favoritism. There should never be a person who walks into our assembly and can conclude that we're a young church, we're young family church, old church, and so I don't really fit here. They should be overwhelmed by the kindness and the love that we extend to them. Listen, the love that we have received in Christ is truly amazing. It is unparalleled. It is unlike anything in this world. And we have the opportunity to love others with that same kind of love. And we would discriminate to whom we would show love, kindness, honor, care. How do you view relationships? As, as I've worked through this text, I've been challenged to, to think on, on the fact that I'm prone or the ways that I'm prone to partiality reveals much about how I view relationships. Do you, do you see the connection? Your selfishness is quickly revealed when you sin in regards to partiality. Why? Why is it revealed so? Because if you are prone to partiality or favoritism in this way, it reveals a heart that views relationships selfishly. What can I get from this relationship? I'm going to treat this person with honor because I see these superficial things and I think it will advance me if I show a certain level of kindness to them. But this poor person, that won't advance me in the ways that I desire, so I'm going to show dishonor to them or not give intentional kindness to them. It reveals much about our heart. If you show partiality, you are immediately entering into that relationship with selfishness. This is so sobering, so convicting. It reveals a selfish approach to relationships, and this is completely contrary to what God calls the believer to. It's completely contrary to what God calls you to, Christian. It's what he calls me to. The believer is to consider others' needs above their own. The believer is to love their neighbor, love their enemy. The believer is not to have thoughts in regards to what this person might do for me. How might this person advance me or benefit me? There's no place for that thinking in our lives. Did you ever have the friend growing up that just wanted to come over to your house because of the things that you had? Or maybe you were the friend that wanted to go over to another's house because of the cool things they had. Selfishness. Selfish outlook, approach. That attitude is completely un-Christ-like. It's selfish, it's arrogant, it's unlovel, unloving. It is evil and it is wicked. And James' instruction here is not to treat, again, rich people poorly and treat poor people richly. We're to not make distinctions. We recognize individuals as souls and we pour ourselves out in love for every individual. Some are easier to pour yourself out for. Some are hard, harder. But don't make distinctions. Pour yourself out for others in love. Rich, poor, young, old. It doesn't matter what ethnicity, what culture. We throw ourselves at every relationship in love and consideration. The only favoritism that God accepts is that where we demonstrate preference, preference towards everyone but ourselves. And listen, we have the perfect example. 
God's not calling us here to something that is uncharacteristic of himself. Remember Moses' proclamation, glorious, mighty, awesome, impartial. Consider Romans 5, 6, and 7. As you consider impartiality and not showing favoritism, think of, think of what God has done for you, believer. Romans 5, 6 through 8. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ didn't extend the kindness that brought you to repentance because of what he could get from you. He didn't make distinctions on superficial, worldly things. God gave of himself to the point of sending his son to die on the cross and to have placed upon his son, he placed upon his son the righteous, just wrath for all who would ever, for all time, believe upon his son in faith and repentance for the forgiveness of sins. God did that without showing any partiality, without playing favorites. He gave of himself to the point of death on a cross. That is the attitude of Christ, our Savior, and that is the attitude that we are to have, not one of personal favoritism. God had nothing to gain from me that led him to sacrifice his son for me. Any good that comes from something in my life is a direct result of the work of Christ. So behind this command to forsake favoritism, we actually see a God who is impartial and has extended a unique, unparalleled, great, awesome, mighty, powerful to change love towards helpless sinners. And in his call for us to forsake favoritism, we get to put on display the character of God towards those who enter into our assembly. Are you impartial? If you are, take courage, my brother, my sister, because that is an indication that Christ is at work in you. This is an attribute that is foreign to the world. The world knows nothing of heavenly things and makes complete distinctions based off of vain earthly things. But as followers of Jesus Christ, we can set our minds on things above. We can see souls, not objects of personal advancement. And we can make much of Christ. We can put on display the self-giving love towards others without thought of ourselves and what we might gain for the glory of Christ. Our desires in this command must be for the salvation of sinners and the glory of Christ as we live obediently reflecting his character for his glory. Why do you come on Sunday mornings? Are you thinking about what everybody else can be for you? I hope the temperature's comfortable for me. I hope the music's loud enough or not too loud. I hope people come and talk to me. I've had a hard week. I hope the preaching is applicable to my life. I hope the NGM workers take good care of my children. I hope, I hope, I hope. Or do you walk into those doors going, how might I pour myself out in love for every individual in the room today? And how I talk 
to people is going to be impacted by the fact that I am demonstrating love towards them and how I sing is going to be impacted by showing love for God and love for others and how I greet one another is going to be impacted by the love that I've received and my eagerness to show that love to others and how I listen to the word of God is going to be impacted by the fact that I want to be better equipped to be able to be pleasing to the Lord and obedience and love for him that I might bless others. Next week, we're going to continue looking at the sin of favoritism. We're going to see not only God's disapproval of favoritism, but specifically what we, why we must flee favoritism, as if verses 1 through 4 was not enough. James gives us more ammunition for seeking to forsake favoritism and pursue impartiality. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your word Thank you for your perfect expression of love and kindness for us in your son, Jesus. Thank you for not playing favorites with us, for not looking to external things that might catch your eye, that would make you want to sacrifice yourself for us. There would be nothing that you could find. Thank you for your character revealed in this command, your impartiality, your self-giving love, your kindness, your unmerited favor that you lavish upon us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be men and women who do not hold our faith in such a glorious, eternal Savior as Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Guard us from sin in this way. Help us to engage our hearts with your glory, your cause, your desires. And Lord, we want this because we want to make much of Christ. We want Jesus' name to be made known in all the earth. So God, we pray that you would aid us in our efforts and help us to not only be hearers of your word this morning, but help us to be doers of your word. I pray that we would never be a church where somebody doesn't stay because they didn't experience love or kindness expressed towards them. If this is not their fellowship, let it be for other reasons than that they were discriminated against or had partiality shown towards another over them. Help us to be active. Help us to have eyes outside of ourselves and help us to be pleasing to you. And we ask these things not for ourselves, but we ask them for your name's sake, for your glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.